As Paul said, I'm, I'm, my collection is primarily British, uh, Queen Victoria to George VI, and I've got, and I do penny black, anything to do with the penny black, and stamps on stamps, but every now and again at um, stamp shows, a cover piques my interest, and about three years ago, I came across this one, and uh, bought it, and then it kind of got hidden amongst other stuff, as we all do, and uh, unearthed it earlier this summer, and I thought, I looked at it closer, and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I've never heard of Wilkins, Wilkins or Ellsworth, and the submarine Nautilus, there must be a, a story behind it. Not only that, why I bought it, um, obviously, it's got the two cent uh, US stamp out of New York uh, cancel, and then it's got a George V three half pence stamp. And I thought, well, what happened here? So we'll get into more of the cover right at the end, but um, just going to uh, walk you through who are these guys? Well, they're two completely opposite characters and come from two different continents. Um, Hubert Wilkins was born in late 1880s in South Australia. He was one of 13 children. He ended up um, going to Sydney where in his late teens, early 20s, he learned photography. And then he got himself to... England, and actually became a pioneer in aerial photography, and uh, went on many, uh, started to do different expeditions, and and uh, got tied in through Randolph Hearst um, with uh, Raoul Admon Admonson to do uh, a flight across the Arctic Ocean, across the North Pole. And in 1928, they, they were very successful in doing that. And as a result, he ended up being knighted by George V. Now, I put here in 1930, with a friend, Lincoln Els Ellsworth, he planned the subarctic expedition. I've been trying to dig through how he came across, how he got connected with Lincoln Ellsworth. And... I think it was through Raoul Admon Admonson because um, as I start to talk about um, Ellsworth on the next uh, slide, um, he, he got linked eventually to um, Admonson as well. So he, he, with his friend Lincoln Ellsworth, they planned the subarctic expedition. And in 1931, this ill-fated subarctic expedition took place in the submarine Nautilus. He died in Framington, Massachusetts in 1958. And in 1959, his ashes were scattered at the Arctic by a crew of the USS Skate. And I've actually got some pictures later of, of that. And um, amazingly, all his papers are at the Ohio State University Bird Polar Research, Research Center. So this is someone who came from very humble beginnings in uh, Australia. He was a real pioneer. I, I, what I didn't mention is post-1931, he actually went to the Antarctic on expeditions with Ellsworth as well. And really, um, he uh, he was quite a, an outdoorsman and became uh, quite an important person in the field of uh, both polar exploration. Now we turn to Lincoln Ellsworth. He was actually born a little earlier, eight years earlier than... Uh, uh, Hubert Wilkins, 
he was really a failed academic, mainly because if the subject wasn't what he was interested in, he didn't bother. He went to Yale, he went to Columbia, he went to Canadian colleges and never really got a degree, but he had a thirst for adventure and uh, he was quite a sickly child and actually by the time he was 40 and he'd done many expeditions in Alaska through the Canadian frontier, working on railroads. He, he did work in his father's mine and he, um, he actually became an engineer. Uh, he got interested in that and studied and uh, late in life got his degree. Um, and then he, he got tied in with uh, Raoul Admon, um, Amundsen. He persuaded, his, his father was very leery of funding any of these polar expeditions and had refused and refused and refused. And finally, uh, in 1925, funded the first attempt to fly to the North Pole with Am Amundsen. Um, and, that caught, and he put up, his father put up $100,000 to do that back in 1925. That, that attempt failed and there were two flying planes and one of them broke down completely. The second one took a month for them to repair before they managed to get uh, back off the polar ice flows and get back to safety. However, in 1926, he did, they did successfully fly to the pole, but this time in a dirigible. And the North Pole was sighted by them on May 12th, 26. Um, as I note further down, um, he was awarded uh, the f his first Congressional Gold Medal for those, those flights for 1925 and 26. Then in 1931, he helped fund, um, he partnered with Wilkins and helped fund the fated Arctic exhibition by Submarine Nautilus. Uh, post that, he did four expeditions to Antarctica. And as a result, he got a second congressional gold medal for claiming 350 square miles of Antarctica for the United States. So Johnny, you know, here's a history lesson for you. <laughs> That's how the U.S. got a large part of Antarctica by this this uh, this gentleman, Lincoln Ellsworth. He died in May 1951, and uh, he was a major benefactor of the American Museum of Natural Histo History Hall of Lincoln Ellsworth, dedicated to his Arctic and Antarctic voyages. So we've got two people connected by Amundsen who uh, had both a love for polar exploration. Now, the project itself to take the Nautilus submarine, the submarine they named Nautilus, um, was actually conceived um, while Hubert Wilkins, or Sir Hubert at that time, he had just married an Australian actress and they were invited by Lincoln. So the two of them to go to his castle or Schloss in Switzerland to spend their honeymoon. It was while they were there, they conceived of the plan of doing this uh, submarine uh, trip to the North Pole and they actually, well, to the polar ice flows. And then their game plan was, well, I, and covered up here. Um, and their game plan was to do scientific experiments and observations while on the, the ice flows, and then to navigate to the North Pole while submerged beneath the ice flows. So they needed a, uh, a submarine, and they tried to buy one from the U.S. Navy, but... Uh, as Hubert Wilkins was not a unit U.S. citizen, um, they agreed to lease it to him, amazingly. <laughs> so 
I don't know whether this was their way of just trying to get rid of an old submarine, but anyway, they succeeded. So the submarine was uh, the O-12 SS-73 built in 1916 by the Lake Torpedo Boating Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was still up there uh, when they bought it, mothballed, and then it was moved to... Uh, just a minute. I'm, I've got to, there we go. To, it was moved to uh, Mathis Shipyard in Camden, New Jersey, where it was stripped of all its military armaments. It was fitted out with, with uh, scientific equipment and superstructure modified to operate between the ice, or at least they hoped it would. Uh, from um, Camden, they then went up to the Naval Yard in uh, Brooklyn and uh, on March 20, arriving on March 24th and on March, sorry, 23rd, on March 24th, Lady Suzanne Bennett Wilkins christened the submarine Nautilus. Uh, as this was prohibition, they couldn't use champagne, so it was a bottle of ice water <laughs> that was used to, to christen the boat. And here we have a, a picture of the actually uh, actually doing that. It's amazing how small it is. Yes, yeah, it's not not a big vessel at all, uh, which makes you wonder why they even wanted to do this. But anyway. So the Nautilus expedition left Bergen on August. The hang on, I'm just yeah. I'm hang on. I'm just going to shoot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the uh, following um, New York, the the uh, submarine traveled across the the uh, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, to Ireland, then England, and then up to Bergen. And on August the 5th, they left Bergen and headed north. They finally fe reached the first ice flow on August the 19th. And if you think, Samuel, if you're commenting on the size of the boat, you look at the number of people they've got on the ice flow, that was going to be pretty cramped quarters, I think. Yes. So and also then they must have had some fuel and food and all this stuff there. oh yes i mean it had to be really cramped because there's what three three six nine twelve fourteen of them so somehow they packed themselves in there so that's uh, that's the first picture of them arriving they look happy because they finally successfully got there no, Wilkins actually went on this. Uh, Ellsworth was just the planning, was doing the planning behind it and didn't travel. So uh, they were able to, um, they were able to manage to conduct scientific experiments on the ice surface, surface and took various samples of water. Um, and although not reaching the, the 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 boat the submarine did not re reach the uh, was not able to submerge fully by the time they got up to the up to the ice flows, but they did manage on August thirty first. Sorry, um, to submerge under a thief, three foot thick ice flow. So I guess in some part they felt that was successful, but it really didn't accomplish getting under the ice flow and all the way to the North Pole as they'd hoped to. Now, there are many reasons why this didn't happen and why I called it the ill-fated trip. So when they first left Camden, New Jersey on March 16th, they got delayed and stuck at the Philadelphia Naval Naval Yard, and then at Mar Marcus Hook. When they entered New York Harbor, one of the seamen fell overboard and drowned. So that was a tragedy. 
the next part, while crossing the Atlantic, they encountered severe storms. And one of the engines failed, and then they tried to carry on with just the starboard engine, and then that failed, and they had to uh, do a mayday, uh, mayday uh, radio blast to uh, hope that they could be rescued. And they were, by chance, the USS Wyoming, um, which was out of Annapolis, was on a training mission with naval cadets and happened to be in the vicinity. And they towed them all the way across the Atlantic to Ireland. <laughs> so from Ireland, they then got towed by another vessel to England where they finally got the, re the repairs done and they were able to travel sometime in late July up to, uh, up to Bergen. But that was fraught with more delays and more storms and more me mechanical um, problems. But they did reach the ice flow, as I mentioned earlier. On August 22nd, they were preparing to dive, and one, the uh, second in command of the actual uh, submarine was checking the diving rudders and discovered that they weren't there. So some of the crew were really nervous about probably going under the ice flow, and they'd actually taken off the diving rudders and the boat, the vessel was sabotaged. By September the 8th, they were back in Bergen and was about, they were about to set out to England and they hit the worst storm of the expedition. The hull was damaged, they had engine failure and again, they were towed back to Bergen. Finally, after permission from the US Navy, they had the USS Nautilus was finally towed on November 30th to a Norwegian fjord and sunk. And there it remains. So all the planning didn't really help them when they were uh, trying to, uh, to get to the North Pole. The weather really was their worst enemy. And this old sub just couldn't handle the storms that they encountered. And I think they just encountered far more storms than they ever thought they would. So as I mentioned, Hubert Wilkins, um, in his will, wanted his ashes scattered over the Arctic ice. And so the USS Skate, which I think is a nuclear sub, um, went to the North Pole on March March 17th, uh, 1959, the year after he died. And this is a picture of them scattering his ashes as per his, his wishes. Getting now back to the cover, I had done some research on uh, trying to find out who Edward Reiner is. And I couldn't find any reference to him at all. And so my first thought about this cover that we, it was really created by him because the only ones I'd heard of were his covers. Um, he would, he'd sent it to Hubert Wilkins in May of uh, 31. And then it was, I think the covers were then taken by the, the submarine to England, somewhere along the line, this uh, rubber stamp was added to it. And um, as you can see, we've got a New York cancel and it's got an October 18th cancel from London back to Edward Reiner in New York. So it seems the cover the uh, the cachet of the the rising the 
Aurora Borealis and the submarine at the North Pole was added somewhere off, was obviously added after Mr. Reiner sent this card to, to Hubert Wilkins. Um, what I'm not sure about is did the, did the envelope actually go up with the sub to the polar ice flows? And then come back with them to Bergen, and then back to to London, uh, and then got mailed in October. And what it, I think they might have done because what I couldn't find out was when Wilkins actually got back to London. Um, we know that the submarine was sunk in November, th uh, November of um, of thirty one, November thirtieth. And this is dated October 18th. So maybe it did go all the way up there. And maybe that's where they canceled it. And then it came back and that Wilkins was actually back in London in October, mid-October. Because they would have had to have got through to the Navy and U.S. Navy and negotiated what to do with the sub. And maybe they couldn't do that from, Nor from uh, Bergen. So... Um, so maybe this is actually genuine, but I can't find any reference as to actually when the uh, the rubber cancellation was was actually attached to the to the cover. Then uh, that's just the highlight of the different cancels. Uh, we've got the May uh, in New York, and then uh, 18th of October back to uh, to Edward Reiner. And I thought that he was probably the only one that had done this. He'd heard that Wilkins was doing this. Maybe somehow he heard of, heard of the expedition and created a bunch of these covers to go up there because obviously Mark, Mark has, has a couple. Although you said, Mark, yours, you've got one um, stamped Spitsbergen. So obviously they did get it. They went up there. Uh, but... A little bit more recently, I did, and that's that's the better copy of what the uh, the rubber stamp looks like. Um, kind of an outline of their their sub, and and uh, it's like a stylized version of the Aurora Borealis. But I did manage to find this. So there were other covers. And there are quite a number of uh, Norwegian covers, and I think a couple of Swedish covers um, that bear the same um, cachet. Again, this is someone out of Chicago who did this, but this time this was sent back from Bergen, back to Chicago. Um, so other covers do exist, and... Uh, and I'm still looking to see if I can find others. I mean, this cover is something out of my normal collection, but it really just fascinated me. And these two characters, uh, Wilkins and Ellsworth, coming from two completely different family backgrounds to, to actually get together and create this expedition in their, uh, well, they were in their... 40s when they did this um, just to me seemed uh, a larger than life story so uh, I'll entertain any questions um, you may have but um, Mike one. Um, you're saying with the purple rubber stamp on your original cover for Mr. Reiner, um, that it, you thought he might have added it? Well, at first, because I, I, re I really didn't know. Um, but I think now, now that we've got another version, this mm -hmm. the, the rubber stamp is obviously something that the expedition created. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting that it has the to and the from, you know, that you can yeah. kind of multiple choice 
on, on both different origin of covers. Yep. Yep. But interestingly, this one is sent back from uh, Bergen. Actually, before they had it, if you look here, it's the 4th of August. So this was actually, be was that the date? I have to go back. I think that was the date yeah, they left. That was the initial date, yeah. Fifth. Yeah, that was the date they left for the ice flows, the day before. So this cover didn't actually travel um, up to the ice flow. And I don't know whether the cover that I have dated October 18th uh, in London just remained in London <laughs> and didn't actually go to the North Pole. So... Uh, but it, was, really. it looked like it was autographed by Hubert Wilkins. This one? Um, Looks like it could be a Hubert Wilkins. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, oh, I got one other s slide. Uh, post uh, the uh, exhibition, uh, both of them have been honored by the British Antarctic Terror Territory with then with them on the on stamps and uh wilkins post coming after he did this expedition he he did many personal appearance appearances to to kind of gather funds to uh repay the money that he'd actually personally laid out on this uh expedition uh i know that uh Randolph Hearst put in uh, $70,000, uh, Wilkins put in 70000 of his own, and goodness knows what all the repairs en route in England and up in, in Norway cost them. But uh, they were probably indebted, although Ellsworth was, was a very wealthy man, so it really didn't bother him. So Interesting. And then I've got... So going back to the to the covers, um, some of this is speculative because there's just no. While there's a lot of detail about the uh, their expedition, um, there's really nothing written like that I could find out. Um, I came across something very funny on the internet. If I can share my screen for a second. Yeah, I'll I have to. Like to show it. How do I get out? Do I have to unshare somewhere? I think it's... Uh, oh, stop close share. it down, yeah. Yep. Now you're good. Okay. Now, let me just... Uh, it, this will take only a minute, hopefully. So this is what I found out, which I thought it was uh, really funny. I don't know what the date of this is, but oh. Oh obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously uh, it was, there is a lot, there are lots of references on the, on the net to, you know, to uh, Wilkins and so on. It's just very interesting, but Nothing that I could find uh, during this presentation <laughs> about the uh, stamps or covers, but yeah. like, attracted the attention at uh, at the time. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show. That <laughs> is kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I scanned in both of my covers, and I don't have anything on the back. There's nothing on the back. But uh, oh. I can, I'll go and I'll show you what I have. And um, it looks like the purple uh, submarine with the Aurora Borealis. What? It looks like it's on top of the two cent Washington yeah. that I have. Oh, geez. It's a, yeah. Uh, uh, let me, let me, uh, can I get in there? Yeah, I can do this. Hold on. 
you can see that the ink mark over here goes over top of the stamp. So it must have been after the fact. And this is a London one with for 4th of October, 31. And then on the, I have, I think I have the same date as you do on, it's uh, eight, whatever, what was the date? 18th, August 18th, maybe at, yeah. right? Well, the, the, yeah. The, um, the cover that I showed from Bergen was 4th of August. Okay. I don't and know. And this one, a little bit later. A little bit later. And actually, they were, they were up there. Um, well, uh, they didn't get back to Bergen until September. So this was mailed out uh, from Norway while mm -hmm. they were up in the ice flows. Mm -hmm. uh, my feeling is that the 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 cancel or the the cachet of the 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 rubber stamp was applied by the expedition. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but who was mailing these back and when, and whether they, I mean, some could have got to the North Pole, may have, I, I'm not convinced they <clears throat> actually ever got to the North Pole, <laughs> or the ice floes. <laughs> so. And Mike, it's interesting that uh, last two covers, it was to Hubert Wilkins, care of general delivery. So I don't see a guy, you know, ready to go to the North Pole checking a general delivery box unless there's some kind of arrangements that he might be getting yeah. covers. And maybe yeah. there's a little a fee involved, you know. Mm -hmm. I wonder. I mean, they... Marty? Yes. I've got Seems a range of uh, Hubert Wilkins covers, um, and I'm from Melbourne, Australia, so it's tomorrow where I am. Uh, oh, oh, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done any disservice to you. <laughs> so that's all right. Um, and uh, I've got two f of the what I'd call a boomerang cover, forgive me being Australian. You know, that's one that went over and came back. Went out and came back, yep. So uh, I've got two, and one is postmarked in London on the 3rd of October, and the other one is postmarked on the 19th of October. Oh, Interesting. Interesting. I have them in my hand, but I'm not quite good enough to actually share that with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, actually, I omitted another kind of interesting anecdote about Wilkins. He he was in London when the war, World War One broke out, and he signed up again for uh, active duty in the Australian Army. And there was a, he he was appointed as a, a an army photographer. And somehow in one of the battles, he was with a lot of American troops. And in fact, the particular group that he came across lost all their officers. They didn't have any officers and they were perplexed what to do. Apparently, he rounded them all up and kept them in control and led them until re reinforcements arrived. <laughs> so he, w he was certainly a go-getter, you know. He, he just took command of the situation. And uh, uh, one of those other little little anecdotes about, uh, about him. I, I recently went to an Antarctic uh, reunion meeting um, yes. and uh, they were actually showing video of uh, the Wilkins El Ellsworth flights, original video. Mm -hmm. And it was extraordinary what they did. They they flew for days and days over land that no one had ever been on before. Um, mm -hmm. Some of down near the South Magnetic Pole, which must have created enormous um, navigational problems. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure how you operate a compass when the magnetic poles are uh, influencing things in back in those more primitive days. And they landed on the ice, and they were gone for they were gone for a long, long time. People long had given them up for dead when they finally got back to, uh, you know, well, we won't say civilization, but finally got back yeah. to a base. And uh, yeah. they did numerous of those flights, and they're just quite extraordinary when you think about them. Yeah. Well, actually, the the first uh, flight that Ellsworth took that was a disaster with the two planes that they was stuck for a month trying to repair one from parts of the other one. Um, sadly, his father died not knowing whether his son was lost forever while, while they were 
trying to get back. So that's my little story about a innocuous cover that I spotted at a stamp Lankapex, I think, about three years ago. Well, when, I, when I find mine, I will uh, send you guys a copy. Okay. Great. Any other, any uh, final questions for Mike on his presentation? Just one further comment. You, you do, from time to time, find these covers that have also been carried on his Antarctic flights. So I've got some from 1928 when he did his flights in the Antarctic. Oh, and right. And he to the North Pole as well. So they're actually, uh, dare I say, bipolar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I and think he signed I them. Think I think he was quite a merchant. I think he was quite a yeah. marketing man. Yeah. Because some of them are actually numbered, and and they have his little little monogram down in the corner, just an H W, and then it says you know number forty seven. Yeah. So I don't know how many were done, but um, they are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do they have great worth? Anybody know? Um, no. If I own well, it, it means that it's worth nothing. But what are you finding? I, I was going to say I'm a stamp dealer. Am I allowed to say that? Um, I, sell, <laughs> I sell them for a few hundred each. It, it depends on uh, whether he's autographed them and uh, where yeah. they've been exactly. Uh, but if they're actually uh, ones that have been both to the south and the north, um, I, I think they're probably four or five hundred US each. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Ones to just the north are far more plentiful, but they're still not common. And they are, you know, they're a cover with a magical story, which a lot of covers don't have. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I admit, I picked mine up for five bucks. <laughs> so. Yeah. Any, anytime you want to sell that for a profit. <laughs> Well, it's tied to a presentation now. So. I don't know. No, not at all. <laughs> thanks, thanks for your insight, Tony. That yeah. was good. Yeah. All right. This is I think cool. Zoom works so well when we have this kind of uh, discussion with people from, from, like I said, all over the world. Uh, Tony, are you in, uh, you're in Australia now? I am. I'm in Melbourne. We've just come out of five months of lockdown, so I'm... Yeah, I'm totally up to where, to where you poor people are in some respects. Yeah, uh, better than we are. Summer to my delight, and uh, it is um, something like eleven a.m. I haven't got my watch, but it's roughly eleven a.m. on Thursday. Oh, good for you! And I would normally be at work, but I thought this is a very good excuse to avoid that. I so, <laughs> now I remember your request when you mentioned being a stamp dealer and from Australia. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, and you, we, we also out? have Eastern Standard Time. So when you said it was Eastern Standard Time, that threw me for a while because I then finally clicked, ah, now you're talking about US time rather than Australian. Yes. <laughs> That's why I suggested, you know, go to an application and yep. they'll, they'll, oh, they'll do it for you. It yeah. worked. So how did you find out that we were doing this? Uh, I, I joined the, um, the virtual show that the APS held a little while ago. And um, I sort of, I, I, I look at my emails from time to time, not all the time because I get so many of them, but uh, I saw that was on and I thought, oh, wonderful. Um, oh. I've actually, because I've listed on uh, eBay, I've listed a number of these items. This isn't a commercial plug, I'm just telling you. Um, I've, I've had a few people who've contacted me who are obviously very, very keen enthusiasts. And there is actually a Sir, Herb, Sir Hubert Wilkins Society that collects stamps. Wow. And uh, one of them is in the UK, and I was just trying to message him before this to tell him to see if he could get on it. And I've got another chap in France. Um, I, I went to a, uh, a thing at the Melbourne Shrine recently, and as you said, Hubert Wilkins was one of the first World War official photographers. And uh, I mentioned that during the talk, and one of the rooms at the Melbourne Shrine uh, of Remembrance is actually called the Sir Hubert Wilkins Room. And uh, I made comment on that, and there was a lady in the in the audience who said, "Oh, I'm his granddaughter." And um, I mentioned that in passing to this French chap, and he said he didn't have any grandchildren. His wife and he had a very very strange arrangement. <laughs> they, <laughs> we, we would call it an open marriage or something. You know, they had <laughs> partners of uh, partners of choice whenever they wished, and uh, I don't think I'm I'm not sure that they had children or not. I'm not certain on that, but. Uh, they um, they sort of met from time to time, and the rest of the time, you know, all was fair in love and war. 
Yeah. Thank you. So, interesting. But I mean, you know, this is somebody in Paris who was giving me a, a rundown on the finer points of Hubert's <laughs> personal life. So that they're, they're very keen. <laughs> well, other comments or comments on our comments? I'd like to uh, mention two things uh, for Mike and his pursuit of more information about this expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, the American Society of Polar Philatelists has been publishing a journal for over 50 years, and there are a number of articles in the, in the uh, back issues on this uh, uh, expedition. And if uh, Paul can send me uh, Mike's email address, uh, I'll be sent, uh, glad to send him information about uh, the availability of the back issues, they're all available in PDF format on, on a DVD. A second suggestion I have is that there's an APS judge, Hal Vogel, who is probably knows more about uh, polar philately than anyone else on the planet. Uh, he knew that Mike was giving a talk this evening, but unfortunately, Hal is traveling and he's not uh, near a computer where he could uh, join us this evening. But I could, uh, again, send Mike uh, Hal's uh, contact information if he wants to ask uh, Hal uh, specific questions about the Wilkins uh, Ellsworth expedition. Yes. I, I made a note and I'll send that to you, Alan. I'll send Mike's. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And Mike, you Pre know the rules when you talk to this gentleman, uh, if he has any free time next year on the second and fourth Wednesdays at 615, that he'll get in touch with us. I think the polar philately is catching. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, I, I didn't Alan. even know there was a, such a society of polar actually, philately. Actually, there's one in Australia, too. There's a, uh, it's called the Australian Society for Polar Philately. And there's a fellow named Peter uh, Koffler, I think is the editor of the journal. Uh, there's a group in England with the Polar Postal History Society. And then there's the American Society of Polar Philatelists, which I happen to be secretary of as well as editor. That's why I know about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Inside no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of both the British and the Australian ones, and there's, uh, I think there's also, also one in France and one in Germany and one in Spain that I'm aware of. So That's, that's yeah. true. Okay. Anything else on Paul Worf Ladley? Uh, just just one over. question. Um, yep. are, these, um, are these actually recorded? Can people access this talk they, they later are. on? Or? Uh, uh, Suzanne copies is uh, makes copies of them, and uh, as of tonight, starting with this one, they're going to go to uh, Steve Kennedy for editing, and then to Charlie, and there will be a uh, a YouTube channel with all these on them recorded. Okay, because mm -hmm. yes, if I could get a copy of that or a I'll put you, I'll put you on our I list. Got a lot of other people list. I could share that with happily. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope I did justice to this <laughs> one cover. <clears throat> I was it opened, aware it when opened I, up a whole yeah. A whole I, new for me. I just wasn't aware when I started to do this project that uh, this is really an, an offshoot, a one-off outside my normal collection. So um, I was just rummaging around on the internet to find what I could. So I feel very uh, honored that I've got people who are so connected to polar, polar philately uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting today. I got a feeling you're going to get a lot more information soon. And yep. remember, it is very addicting. <laughs> yeah. Could have started a whole new collection here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of the, one of the two covers that I got, Mike, uh, yeah. I bought a bunch of ship covers and there's a bunch of constitution and things of that nature. But in there was about, I think there was like six or eight uh, of bird, I guess after he did all his traveling and expeditions to Arctic and Antarctica and all that mm -hmm. stuff, he went on a, on a speaking tour and mm -hmm. there was covers for all the places that he went, all these people, all these groups and different cities and stuff had, you know, uh, covers uh, printed up and, and uh, for his tour with little yeah. caches and things of that nature. So now I'm going to get into, I guess I'm going to start looking at Arctic. Well, yeah. I, know, I guess. I'm <laughs> polar, polar, polar philately. And Alan, I think you might be able to comment on the bird because I remember sending you one and you said, 
they were common. It was the mecca of stamp collecting, and FDR was president, and he was a friend of FDR's, wasn't he? Uh, that's true. Um, yeah. as, as far as the speaking tour, this occurred in, after his second Antarctica expedition. So it was probably in that, around 1934, 35, 36, he was doing a speaking tour and trying to raise additional funds because he fell short of the actual cost for that expedition. But uh, there are people who collect these. And again, in the uh, back issues of the, of the uh, Ice Cap News Journal, uh, there are lists of all the towns that he stopped on his uh, speaking tours and people collect them and, and all the caches and whatnot. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I've been, Alan, I've been I surprised have... through, through my, uh, you know, the years that I've been in, in France and I do subscribe to a, a, a monthly journal over there, L'Eco de Tumbrala, Tumbrology. I've written seven or eight articles for, but um, polar philately is very popular there. There's a, there's a section in almost every monthly uh, journal on, on Antarctic uh, expeditions that are still going on today, and uh, it chronicles the uh, you know all of the, the covers that are that are serviced and the, it follows the ships and the whole nine areas. I've been really amazed that it's that it's that popular, but it's popular enough that there's a, a column in almost every one of the journals throughout the entire year. Nice. And Alan, I have a question for you. Um, how I could not find how uh, Hubert Wilkins and Lincoln Ellsworth actually met. I assumed it was through Amon Amundsen, but I couldn't find any reference to where and how they met and became such friends. I do not know personally. I wondered about that myself when you mentioned it. Uh, I'm sure that Hal Vogel could uh, clear that question up, and that's why I wanted to get you his contact information. Thank you. Appreciate it. Admiral Byrd actually visited the Reading Stamp Club for a presentation. I have uh, a cover they made, and it's autographed by him. Mm -hmm. when, when was that, Dave? Uh, in the 30s. I'm not sure when. Uh, I don't have in front of me. I just pulled an album out. I also have a registered cover from Wilkins. Mine is May of 31 from New York City, and it's registered July 7th or July something, 6th from London. And it was sent by Sir Hubert Wilkins. Uh, he has his address over the purple hand stamp, and it was sent to a person in New York City. And it has a two-cent Washington, and it has two uh, British stamps, uh, to pay the registered rate. So there you go. I have a registered one. Nice. And I, I, everybody seems to have October from London, but I have July 6th from London. So that, there's a new wrinkle. No, that, that would actually fit in because that would be the timeline when after they were towed from on June 13th across the Atlantic to Ireland and then on to, on to England, to Portugal. Okay. This must have been on board because he has he 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 has his name he he signed it and his delivery address in New York City and it's stamped yeah. from and then the two yeah. address is New York City as well so it must yeah. have gone from New York to London it got the rubber stamp and registered in London on July sixth and it came back to New York City. Yep, it fits the timeline of when they were when they were in uh, in England. Yep, and I have the right the, on the rear of it. I have four hand uh, stamps, register stamps, on the rear of it. Well, so it's well documented. It's a nice clean cover. Other comments, questions on polar flatly? I think we could build a census this in this group here. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Yeah. You're welcome. I think I've opened a whole new topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good presentation.